Welcome in to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast, the official podcast of your New Orleans Pelicans, a podcast dedicated to everything you need to know about the squad. Hear from players, coaches, broadcasters, and those who cover the NBA on a daily basis. It's time to flock up. The New Orleans Pelicans podcast starts right now. All right, welcome to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. As always, appreciate you for tuning us in. It is the official podcast of your New Orleans Pelicans. Gus Cattengill with Mr. Jim Eichenhofer of NewOrleansPelicans.com. Jim, we continue our player profiles. We did the starting lineup last week. Hard to believe that um, we went through a, a starting lineup that, yay, garnered 49 wins. But that doesn't happen if guys off the bench also don't contribute. So we start this week with Trey Murphy. What do you think of when I say, hey, Jim, what do you think of Trey Murphy? Yeah, I think he had a good season. I mean, I think one of the biggest things, and we're going to talk about this with Christian Clark, too, is just his role fluctuated between starter and reserve. I think he's used to that by now because he did that a lot in the previous season. He started 60 plus games, but um, his his role definitely went down in terms of, you know, he started 23, I think it was this season. Mm -hmm. So was he had played more minutes, I think, the year before. A lot of that was because of Zion Williamson wasn't available the previous season. And then this year he was, but I think he made a step forward. I, I don't think it was necessarily as big as a, a step as maybe he wanted to, but a lot of that was because of his knee injury. So I'm really looking forward to the next season for him, hopefully having a, a, a healthy off season, be able to start hit the ground running in October and training camp and go from there because I believe in this guy and his potential and what he's going to be able to do in the future. Well, Christian Clark of the Advocate in Picayune, he's up to give an overview not only on the season, but his thoughts on the season that was for Mr. Trey Murphy. All right, Tom, now to welcome in our guest, Mr. Christian Clark of the Advocate in the Picayune, covers your New Orleans Pelicans and the NBA as we continue our player profiles. Last week, Jim Eichenhofer, we did the starting lineup. Now we move on to some key players that they come in right after, you know, that first time out or whatever you want to do, Christian, you got Trey Murphy today. We're going to get to that in a quick second, but what do you think of the, I guess, first full week of the second round so far of the playoffs East and West? Fellas. Great to be here with y'all. It's, it's been a lot of fun watching these playoffs. I don't know when this is going to run, but right now the Timberwolves are up 2 0 on the nuggets. And <laughs> it has been a butt kicking. I mean, game two, Minnesota and Denver was one of the most shocking things I've I've seen all NBA season, just Denver getting absolutely punked. I, I picked them going back to the finals, and we'll see how this goes. Maybe they can show some life. I think probably not, but is not looking good. And it it, it kind of looks like we're going to have a new champ. That would be the six and six seasons, Jim. Uh, what does that tell you about where the NBA is? Six different champ in six straight seasons. That's a good point. I didn't, I didn't think about that. I have, I do remember people mentioning that in the recent past, but I mean, I guess parody is here. I guess the league that um, Adam Silver and a lot of other people wanted has come to fruition. We definitely didn't have a lot of parody in the previous decade where, you know, the Warriors won how many championships. Um, but yeah, that, that is interesting. That it seems like it's changing hands. And we've talked about this before too, that there's like a, a changing of the guard that is seems to be happening right now in the Western conference. And I think it's interesting, Christian, you and I, we talk a lot of times on a talk show and even here in this podcast and, and parody, I think sometimes fans sometimes listen to it and be like, oh, it's just, it's not very good, right? I mean, there's so many different teams that are just kind of on the level, but I think Jim brings up a good point. I, I look at the West, it's just ridiculous, right? You saw this past week, the, the rankings for defensive player of the year, you have a handful of Western conference players there, the candidates for MVP. They were all Western Conference. <laughs> and then you look, and Jim tweeted this uh, earlier last week where he goes, hey, the two teams that were leading currently, and he tweeted this on Tuesday night after that, that buck kicking, uh, the eighth and 10th seed last year are currently, you know, leading in the Western Conference playoffs right now. So that just kind of gives you an idea. So, you know, there it's parody, but it's like, it's it's a very competitive, I guess, league right now, if that makes any sense. Oh, I mean, 100%. Being in, being in the Western Conference is an absolute bloodbath. I mean, players, David Griffin, all noted 49 wins, got you the third seed in the East this year. Um, you know, very valid point. Like, imagine imagine that Milwaukee team and all that they went through 
if they had endured that playing in the Western Conference. Mm. And, you know, I think there is parity, but one of the other lessons from the playoffs is that I felt like we, you know, basketball fans thought that, well, the regular season doesn't matter as much now as it used to. And when you look at the teams in the West really having playoff success, it's the teams that finished one, two, three in the West. I mean, it looks like Denver is going to go out, but Oklahoma City and Minnesota treated the regular season very, very seriously, finished atop the conference and you're near the top of the conference and, you know, look like the best teams in the NBA along with Boston right now. What do you think of the the this the Pell season overall? Just as an overview, we've been asking this to all our different guests here as well. Just it, I, I, I I've been under a rock. I couldn't watch whatever reason. I'm on the moon. Christian season looks like it's over. The regular season. What what do you make of the Pell's 23-24 season? Yeah, I mean, I, I felt like 49 wins. That was positive, a step in the right direction. I think their best two players consistently being available this season was a huge win. I mean, it like two seasons before that were almost lost seasons just because of the amount of time that, that Zion Williamson and Brandon Ingram missed. So for the, those two guys to be on the floor, 64 and seven games collectively, like that was great to see. I thought there was there was very little drama. That was something, you know, we, we kind of went through in seasons past, like little drama during the regular season. You know, I just wish if Zion was going to tweak his hamstring and, and miss two weeks, it would have been great if that had happened in, in January as opposed to right when the playoffs were starting. Um, but, you know, as a, it ended in a, in a really disappointing fashion, and I understand frustration about it. But I think, you know, the, the months that came before that were, for the most part, pretty good. Christian, kind of switching gears to the player that we're going to focus on today, Trey Murphy. Um, we, we've all, Another thing we've been asking a lot of the guests that have come in, people that are really close to the team that cover it on a regular basis, is just kind of reflecting on, before we get into the specifics of the basketball and on the court, can you kind of discuss Trey Murphy as a, as a person, as kind of like, a, you know, his professionalism, his attitude, his approach, just seems like a fun guy to be around. I know that kind of... I'm sure a lot of fans see that in the interviews he's done and interactions that he has, they have with him. But I mean, what, how do you describe him as far as some of those areas that I mentioned? Yeah. Like a, a hilarious guy. I don't even think I can, you know, sit, say a lot of the jokes uh, uh, on this podcast or anything like that, but a genuinely, you know, funny guy, someone you'd want to hang out with. I think, you know, a lot of times NBA players, it's like, okay, we're laughing at your jokes because you play in the NBA but you're not yeah. really that funny. But mm -hmm. I think Trey is is actually funny. Um, you know, I think a guy who uh gets some fits off a lot of a lot of leather this year. I mean, how many mm. how many cows had to die to dress Trey Murphy this year? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So it's all about the fits, man. He, you gotta you gotta look at the part to to do that. Hopefully it's synthetic, man. <laughs> <laughs> but you bring up it was interesting that I was one of the first things that you brought up in terms of uh I, I guess that attitude and and having that, um, that joy, and I say that word specifically because Christian almost felt like that was a word that we heard a ton of, having joy, playing with joy, finding the joy, um, being happy about basketball, things of that nature. Is, is he one of those players that not only was it important to have joy and play with joy, but was required or or was asked to bring joy? to the facility yeah for sure i mean you know you could you could he was trey murphy was like right there shooting on the same basket after practice every day with jose alvarado and you know whether the pelicans won whether they lost like those two guys were talking crap to each other having fun like going through their routine their routine and and you need guys like that who who have you know that that positive upbeat attitude um trey murphy is probably a guy who like if you look around the NBA, it could play a bigger role on a lot of teams. And and with this team, when everyone is healthy, he primarily came off the bench and, you know, through, through all that, like maintained a really, really good attitude. So I think that's like a huge positive from him of, I'm sure there was part of him who, you know, thought, okay, I'm ready for a bigger role at, at this point in my career, especially after having a fantastic second season, but still, you know, being a, a positive guy and a great teammate we're definitely going to get into next season in terms of what it's going to mean for Trey and some of the possibilities of what 
he could do. Um, but got, kind of going back to the season that was just completed, how did you see the way that he performed? I mean, obviously he missed the biggest, a big chunk of the season at the beginning with a knee injury. And he mentioned how in exit interviews is the first time that he's ever had any kind of significant injury. But I mean, what, what did you see from him just from his performance over the course of the season? Yeah. I mean, missing the first 19 games of the year with the left meniscus injury was, you know, a, a bummer that, that he had to deal with. Like it seemed like, Trey was really going to continue carry that momentum he had last year, you know, starting a bunch of games. I think he started 65 games or something like that. And, and being this guy who made this huge leap as a player into year three, and he wasn't really able to do that because of the injury. I think like right the few weeks, right after he got back on the floor, he looked great. Like he didn't miss a beat. I think he missed two or three games with some left knee soreness there in, Mm -hmm. in the winter. And I think it took, him a little bit to get back up to speed after that. But I, I just think when you look at the totality of it, really good player, like a, a guy who shot 38% from three on almost eight per ten, eight attempts per game. I mean, I, I think he proved I am a high volume three point guy who's incredibly accurate and, and that is here to stay. And I think he's a guy who would start in a lot of NBA teams. And I think, you know, the, those are going to be questions that the people around the team and people in the team are asking more and more as, as we get farther into his career as this guy's starter. Yeah. You know, I, I don't like to make predictions, but I feel somewhat confident that, you know, the 38% that you mentioned that he shot from three is actually going to be low. When you look from season to season of his career that we'll, we'll look back on it and say like, man, what, what happened to him? He only shot 38% that year, but it's still a good number. And like you said, especially on high volume, when you're taking as many threes as he does to be able to shoot that well. Um, you know, you mentioned how it's it's very possible that his role will expand next season, and that could be a big factor in the the team's success or how much they improve next year. What do you think are some of the the key things or areas where you think either he can work on to get better, or things that you'll see more from him with him just being on the court more? Yeah, I think the the things that he should focus on this year is getting getting better with the ball in his hands, and I don't think means going out there on the floor and like trying to do Allen Iverson crossover combinations or anything like that, but just getting better at the simple stuff, attacking in straight lines, getting a crossover, just becoming a little bit more comfortable handling the ball. Not that we're going to, they're going to ask him to like initiate 30 possessions per game or anything next year. And then, you know, I think just continuing to, to grow on, on the defensive end. Um, You know, he's a guy who is kind of a sneaky steals and blocks guy. Like he, He's pretty long. He's got fairly good instincts. So, like, he's done a pretty good job of that. But, you know, just guarding one on one, the Pelicans like to switch defensively. So, like, being able to hold up when he gets switched on to ball handlers at times. And I think when you look at that playoff series, I loved what he did defensively in game one. Like, there's a couple of possessions where it was him and Shea, and he did a nice job on Shea. And then I thought he lost that, that momentum he had on the defensive end as a series went along. Um, so those are the, those are the two things I look at with Trey. There's been discussion, or there was a, a lot of discussion that it, during exit interviews, and the the night of the the elimination game against OKC, as well as you know the the days after that, as far as um, getting a pure point guard or more basketball IQ, more basketball intelligence. Those were a couple of the terms that David Griffin used. Um, how much of do you think? what the Pelicans can do with the rest of the roster maybe or addressing some of those areas can affect Trey in terms of the shot, the kind of shots that he gets. Um, To me, it's just seemed like part of why he shot a little bit lower percentage this season beyond the injuries was, you know, and I don't have any scientific data for this, but to me, just from a feel, it just seemed like maybe the quality of his shots was a little bit less. Like he didn't get as many catch and shoots and and wide open stuff maybe that he did the year before. Hmm, interesting. Um, yeah, that I think that's a good point. Um, I mean, well, you know, when I just look at like the on off stuff with him, like it, they kind of crushed with with Trey Murphy on the floor this year. So, like, I think even this year, I'm like, well, they they fared really well with when he played in his minutes. I think you know, just a large part of the Pelicans' success during the regular season in general was these bench heavy units and just like blowing other teams away, you know, um, like 
five through nine or whatever, you know, like the sure. back end of the Pelicans roster was better than the other teams they they faced in their back end of the roster. And I think Trey Murphy was a huge part of that. But, you know, I definitely see that. Um, I, I just think like any guy who is an advantage creator, like a Zion, like a Brandon Ingram, like you just want a guy like Trey Murphy next to him because he stretches you out to 30 feet, can kind of attack and close outs. I mean, I don't, I don't think it, it was a coincidence that, you know, when you just look at like the Zion Trey Murphy numbers or the Brandon Ingram Trey Murphy numbers, those looked really good because, yeah. you know, he, they're just, they fit well in the offensive end together. How much, and I guess I'm really long-term. And like I said earlier, I, I'm not a big predictions guy, but I mean, how much long-term do you think upside that Trey has? Are we talking about a guy that could become an all-star or approach that level someday if he continues to add stuff to his game and continues to improve? Man, that's, it's so hard to do that in, in the Western conference. Like yeah. I yeah. look at, I look at CJ McCollum and like this, what is he? He's averaged 20 points per game in nine straight years or something like that. And, and he's never made an all-star game. So it's, I mean, it's so hard to do that in the conference he plays in. I mean, you know, you, you can't rule it out. Like he's, he's so young. He's got so much talent on the offensive end. I mean, I think it's plausible. He's just, he's got to get better with the ball in his hands and he's got to continue to, to improve defensively. But I mean, I, I love him as a player. He's he's already really good, and there's a lot of room for him to grow. Yeah, and, and look, Christian, I think he, when you ask fans, I'm sure you've seen your comments, podcasts, articles, what have you. A lot of people consider him a, a building block, right, of the future and looking at him in the team. I'm with you. I, I think one of the things I even said it towards the end of that series and in that series, the way OKC is, no matter how they go about doing this roster this upcoming season, we just – started and talked about the teams that are currently leading in the Western Conference, right? Minnesota, OKC, they, they're going to go out there. They're going to go guard you. They're going to be physical. They're going to get out there in that three-point shot. The three-point shot's so keen today's NBA, but the good teams are going to go out there and guard you. Boston doing the same things. I think for Trey Murphy specifically, people think three first. Christian, I'd like to see him that next level of his game is literally what you just said. Off the ball, I mean, not off the ball, but take you off the dribble an attack. This, this guy was in the dunk contest, right? So, Christian, you're you're guarding him. You're running up to him. Go past you and go dunk that thing. You know, it means like I'm watching that Thunder game, game one, and I everyone on that team is dunking left and right, and that's the thing that gets the crowd going. I, it, it's easier than a missed layup, which I think the Pels lead the NBA in. But specifically with him, he has that. We've seen him kind of improve year and by year, and he adds to that game. That would be my thing I'd put on the dry eraser board over there on airline. Off, you know, just take somebody off the dribble. You have the quickness, you can do that, and then elevate, man, and go finish. To to your point about the Thunder, I mean, it, I think one thing they've prioritized and one thing they're good at is like they have just so many guys who handle the ball, shoot, set screens. I mean, it seems like all five of their starters do all of those things. I mean, they're so interchangeable and like their starters just collectively have, have so few weaknesses and, and they can go five out with chat too. Um, I mean, it, they're, they're an incredible team, man. I mean, that first round series, the Pelicans could have played better, but I mean, a lot of that was just Oklahoma city is, yeah. is really good and they have few weaknesses. It'll be interesting to see what takes place. Christian, appreciate the time as always, sir. Thank you for joining us here on the Pelicans podcast. All right, fellas. I don't want to see any leather fits from you guys. <laughs> I, I tell you what, um, if you are you going all black, I can offer if you go in full leather here as well. You're going all black, uh, like red leather. Are you going to go polka dot? Or what, what are we doing here? If you're you going know, a full leather, I, of course, I know full. this is going to I know this is going to be shocking to both of you guys, but I've never considered a full all leather outfit before. Never. So I have to get back to you on that. I haven't That's, I have not really considered and mulled it. All right. We're doing it here in May of uh, 2024. If the Pelicans win a championship, whatever game to clinch, you're wearing leather pants at the very <laughs> minimum. You're going leather pants. What do you think? Sounds all right. I, I'll commit to that, Gus. <laughs> Sounds good to me. I don't know if we want to see that, but we, we're doing it. We, we, Jim will dress in full okay. no, on the possible game clinching, you know, NBA finals game for the Pelicans. How about that? <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see how next season goes. And, and if, 
the season is headed in a really good direction. Maybe I'll head over to a store or two and see what they have on, on sale for me. You did notice a man whose job and profession is to come up with words and write many of them has been silent during the yes. entire discussion at C Clark <laughs> underscore one, three. That is Kristen Clark as always appreciate the time. Thank you, Jim, as always as well, bud. Thanks. Gus. As always, we appreciate Christian's time. Uh, Jim, when you look at this week and we look at the rest of the Pels, uh, I guess, contributors is, is a way we can look at it, too, not just bench players because some of them had to start and think. I, I think that's one thing that I'm going to keep in mind as we talk about these players, too. Basically, just that's the way the game is. But a lot of these players have had to start. And Trey Murphy is one of those guys that had to get in and was the guy that was designated to start when Brandon Ingram went down. He's in the lineup. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these guys that we're going to be talking about this week are in, in have been in situations like that where, you know, it just depends on who's available. Um, unfortunately, some of the guys off the bench that we're going to be talking about also miss chunks of the season, especially November. I think October, November was really when we saw the bench get strained in terms of, um, you know, Najee Marshall was out, didn't start at the beginning of the season, available. Jose was the same way, but I'm looking forward to over the course of the of the next few days to continue talking about the bench. Um, we haven't solidified all of the guest lists yet for who we're going to have, but we're going to have Aaron Summers talking about Larry Nance Jr. on Tuesday. We're going to have Jose Alvarado as the uh, the player profile on Wednesday, and then Thursday and Friday we're going to have Najee Marshall and Dyson Daniels with Mr. John DeShazer helping us um, recap those seasons, and then. Um, next Monday will will be the fi- the eleventh one and the final one with Jordan Hawkins, and uh, we will have Will Guillory on for that as well. So looking forward to this, and and we're we're starting to head down the home stretch, wrapping up the season here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. See what takes place as we get going. As always, man, appreciate the time. Jim underscore Eichenhofer is a way to follow Mister Jim Eichenhofer from NewOrleansPelicans.com. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Gus. As always. Yep, for sure. We'll see you again next time on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Join us three times per week on pelicans.com, the Pelicans mobile app, the iHeartRadio app, or where you get your podcast. And be sure to give Jim and Gus a follow on X at Jim underscore Eichenhofer and GCAT underscore 17. We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast.